And it is our pleasure to be back on First and Now, your official BC Lions podcast. What a night, what an afternoon it was at BC Place. Lions taking down the Stampeders on Saturday, 37-9. We had Wall of Fame, we had history videos, uh, still getting some kudos about those. Matt Baker, Nick Kowalski, and Nick, yeah, uh, the win was the proverbial icing on the cake, as we love our metaphors here on this podcast, but uh, pretty solid Saturday at the Dome. Yeah, another busy home game at BC Place and another victorious game, another fun game. Uh, you mentioned the Wall of Fame stuff. It was great to see all the love Wally Buona was getting, and that was I was obviously expected to come, and, yep. and the Water Boys, of course, too. Um, obviously, you uh, hosting the the pregame reception and the, and the banquet mm-hmm. hall, and then seeing the Wall of Fame induction. Yeah, the stage out at midfield at halftime. It was really cool to see. Uh, we we of course we all covered it from the digital side too. So uh, a recap piece on on that uh, on that aspect of the win Saturday will uh, be coming out shortly. But yeah, awesome. the, the, the team keeps rolling. Yeah, it does. And, and very quickly on that, uh, was a real thrill, a real pleasure for me to be part of the round table in the pregame banquet with Wally Buono, of course. So we interviewed him last week for On Tap. I played snippets of that on this podcast. Encourage you to check it out if you missed any of that. But a chance to catch up uh, with Dennis Skulski, Maury Keith, Jamie Pitplato, Tom Malone. A couple of those names may not resonate as much, but believe me, all of these men were instrumental in re-engaging the BC Lions in the community, in the business world. And uh, those were some tumultuous times before uh, Bobby Ackles, uh, the late great Mr. Ackles, started the Water Boys and brought Wally here. And Wally was quick to point out that everyone, ourselves included, crediting Bob Ackles, but it was David Braley as well. I heard that, yeah. Who played a role in that. And uh, that was a very, very cool part of it for me. Uh, Yes, uh, 37-9, another reminder that any any given week, any given night, anything can happen in pro football. Going into that, we kind of thought, okay, Calgary have to be on our toes here. Just played well against Toronto, grounded and pounded their way. But uh, this BC Lions defense, I guess we can talk about it first. Uh, <laughs> ho-hum, another home game, no touchdowns allowed. Just the one major allowed in, what, four home games this year? Yep. That came against Montreal, and, um, and we were kind of... Uh, kibitzing when we were walking out of BC place on on Saturday night. What was Calgary's longest play of the night? I think it was a 15 yard run or, or screen pass to Kadeem Carey, something like that. Wasn't a lot of field position to be had. And Ryan Phillips, you know, that group, they were flat out embarrassed. We won't sugarcoat it in Winnipeg. Perfect response, not just the defense, but the whole team. Yeah, and I think it, you got to mention Vernon Adams Jr. Obviously, off yes. the top two, just coming first drive, boom, boom, boom in the end zone, come back, boom, boom, field goal, come back again later in the quarter, and then hit Hatcher again for a touchdown. So first four drives scoring came to twenty points. Yeah, yeah. So right off the top, uh, they they wanted to make a statement, um, especially after how Winnipeg went right and having Vernon back and, and leading the team, not, not even leading the offense, but leading the team, being that vocal leader, right. Uh, it, it proved to be monumental, and then having uh, Keon Hatch is one of the best receivers in the CFL right now. Like, I think we can say that at this point. I think and he's gravitated toward that that level, and and I think stats. the I think the national yeah. media is aware of that too. I think yeah. And here last year we were saying yeah he's one of the best in the league, but now on a national scale, I think having 170 yards, going for a touchdown. Um, and him and VA just have a special connection too, and it's really since VA stepped in, they've had a special connection. So. It, it's it's great to have that embarrassment of riches at receiver. Yeah, and uh, we have some post practice sound uh, from VA and Hatcher. If you encourage people to head to our website, our YouTube channel, it's everywhere. Where Keon kind of talks about the relationship they had since he got here. He talked about the funny socks, the dingy socks. Yeah, he was wearing. And uh, yeah, th- this offense. I mean, there may be the odd night where the defense gives up some yards and you know actually gets scored on, but. If they have these receivers playing at this level, not going to be many teams or any team in this league that that is going to stop them. Uh, seven players caught at least one touch, not caught at least one pass. Sorry, <laughs> seven touchdowns. That be wouldn't that be something? We got, we got be four. Like, we got four. Uh, David Mackey had a reception. That Taquan Mizell uh, had a touchdown reception. Really put that game. Uh, I don't want to say out of reach before halftime, but. 27-6 at half. 
don't think anyone's coming back on this defense in BC place on that. And we were proved right in that regard. And that's a key moment for me too. Cause remember you can point to maybe one Vernon Adams mistake throws the interception to Micah Alway. But after that, Matthew Betts gets the punt block. That's officially a punt block, by the I way. I saw that. No, we, yeah. We were notified by Steve and Jeff. Steve Daniel, our historian, uh, Jeff Creever at the CFL Stats, do a great job. Uh, despite uh, some of the the mishaps this year, those guys are, are working uh, their you-know-what's off to try and get this right. But uh, Betts doesn't get a sack when he gets the punt block. That sets up the Mizell score. So when the offense uh, doesn't finish, the defense, the special teams there to back them up. That's an element of this team that has been clicking, and it's a big reason uh, seven and two at the halfway point going into Saskatchewan on Sunday. Yeah, uh, I think I think Rick uh, Campbell talked about it to the media today too, because it was brought up uh, a little bit. Betts was that playing at a historical pace. The 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 sacks haven't been there in the last three games, yeah. but I think if you're just watching the games, and and Rick attested to this too, that Matthew Betts is still making quite an impact, <laughs> whether it's with pressures. Uh, I believe he had a pass deflection. Uh, on Saturday, and then he also, I know he made, he made a tackle where he tracked down Jake Mayer a couple yards past the line of scrimmage on, on, on backtracking him after he took off. So um, uh, th- there's nothing to worry about with Matthew Betts if anyone has any worries for whatever reason. He's still one of the most dominant defensive players this season, and um, maybe a little teaser here, but uh, probably a front runner for most outstanding Canadian and maybe some other uh, awards at this yes. point. But um, yeah, like the, the defense too, and it, it's really everybody, like everybody stepping up every single game, and you got Gary Peters making another interception. Uh, I thought Bo, Bo Lacombo was another tackle machine uh, last uh, on Saturday, and obviously stopping Kadeem Carey and Diedrich Mills and whatever else Calgary brought up in the run game. So that's big too, and Obviously, the guys just rotating in and staying healthy plays a bigger role, too, but it, it's really good to see overall. Yep, and uh, halfway there, yes, we'll get to some midseason Lion Awards uh, talk uh, before we're done here. We're going to hear from receivers coach Jason Tucker on, like we talked about, a bit of an embarrassment of riches as far as these playmakers, these receivers go. But yeah, bets at the halfway point, still on pace uh, to break Brent Johnson's record. He's going to have to get off the schneid here to keep that pace at 10 sacks at the halfway point. Brent, of course, had 17 in 2005, the year he broke the record for Canadians. So uh, we shall see. And yeah, quickly, you mentioned Keon Hatcher, though, too, getting that national recognition. Uh, Second week in a row, he's been requested for a lot of the TSN uh, interviews, uh, the Zoom calls they do, the sit downs that you see on the broadcast and on Sports Center. So they're starting to know. He's yeah. he's starting to get well, those requests. Wasn't uh, Ali B? And by Ali B, I mean Alex Hollins. He was getting some of that TSN love too with those sit downs. That was in Edmonton yeah. a couple of weeks ago. So three they're, they're weeks catching ago. on. We got yes. a new wave of these receivers coming in, and and not it's not even the new wave too. And you speak about the old wave. Lucky Whitehead scores a touchdown too, and that's obviously yep. his first one of the year. And you can just hope that that kind of opens the floodgates from him and maybe boosts his confidence up to get more touches in the offense and but the, I, again it goes back to the thing there's only one football and I think fans have to realize that, yeah. that when you have five six receivers that can make plays on any given day um it's it's not going to be like somebody's going to have to step up and last week it was Keon the week before it was it was it was a Winnipeg game but the week before that it was Hollins for example right and so with, it can be anybody yeah and sorry with R- Dominique Rhymes on the six game who knows if he serves that entire six weeks just had the first with his knee injury. We just have to get him right for the stretch drive at this point. I think you never want to see guys on the shelf like that, but um, the luxury of having uh, this depth and maybe, maybe rhymes being out allows lucky to get himself uh, reestablished as a go-to guy. And uh, yeah, it was great to see him get the fourth and final touchdown of the night. We're going to talk about this challenge in Saskatchewan, but we're talking receivers. We might as well tee it up right now. Uh, We had a talk with uh, Jason Tucker, Lions receivers coach, third year on the coaching staff, a long-time solid contributor as a player in this league with Edmonton, a Grey Cup champion a couple of times, 2003-2005. He's a Texas guy, so he's kind of laughing at us talking about how hot the weather is. We'll get to that, but we spoke uh, with Tuck, as we affectionately call him, uh, following Tuesday's walkthrough practice here in Surrey. And Coach Tucker is with us now uh, following uh, another solid offensive performance. Uh, Tuck uh, had a couple days since. Uh, we're on to Saskatchewan, but looking at the film and talking to your receiving group, uh, what do you see when you rewatch the win over Calgary? 
Yeah, you know, a lot of good things. You know, a lot of things to learn from and a lot of things we can get better at, you know. So, but it all came together when we needed to. And we, like I said, we had a great offensive output and we able to put up points and get a win. Um, Coach Rick, just hearing his post-practice scrum and the theme continues about how this group injuries and everything they haven't all been together but you've seen people step up like an alexander holland's prime example just your assessment of the next man up mentality and how that's benefited the team well it's a, it's a big thing huge thing you know these guys are professionals they know you know when your opportunity comes you got to take advantage because you never know when the opportunity might come back by you know if you miss it then that's the way you can be out of the door you know so these guys are very pros they're professionals they do their job and you know, like i said they step in and we don't miss a beat um, Keon Hatcher goes for a career high. That's another guy came in, just a name on a depth chart a couple years ago, but he's shown what he's capable of. How much fun has it been to watch his progression? Yeah, it's a lot of fun. You know, like you said, he came in and he did all the right things in camp to impress us, and we kept him around, and now his time has come and, he, and he's shining. Saskatchewan week, uh, I know it's always a big one because Coach Rick asking us to have the crowd noise ready for <laughs> Wednesday practice. That's when it feels real, right? But uh, just how much fun. I know as a player you did it a bunch of times, but still get a little uh, bounce in your step going into a place like that? Uh, it's, a, it's a special place, you know. Like I said, I've played there, I've coached there, so I've been a part of both sides, you know. When you're coming in as an opposing team, you hate the place because the crowd is so loud and everything else, but when you're there as a coach or a player, you know you like it because they're behind you, you know, so they're supporting you. So it's a fun place to go, and it's going to be a, a fun atmosphere. Uh, defensively, we saw the, a few weeks ago here, they had a game plan uh, to cause some disruption. Of course, uh, VA ends up going down, but uh, just the challenge of facing that defensive unit. Ah, it's going to be a challenge. They're a good group, you know, and they're stepping up and doing what they need to to keep their team in the game. So we're just going to be on our, our A game and prepare right well and take advantage of the opportunities that we have. We'll pass the mic here to young Nick in just a second uh, if his hands aren't too full. But, hey, this heat, everyone's talking about the heat, but you're, you're a Texas guy. You, you went to training camp uh, with the Dallas Cowboys or in Oxnard, California, surely. Uh, it's it's not a glacier type environment, but this heat, it's nothing for you, right? No, not at all. See, but we were in Wichita Falls, Texas before we went to Oxnard, where in Wichita Falls, that's the hot box of Texas. It's usually around 110, 115 on a daily out there. So going to Oxnard was a relief because it was cooler. <laughs> so no, this is a perfect day for me. This is a, a evening in Texas, that's what this heat is. It's just sit out on the back deck and pour a lemonade type of day, right? Exactly what it is. <laughs> Nick? I guess something I want to bring up, and I just found this fascinating by that, you're a coach who goes on the sidelines for the game, whereas half the other coaches, for those that don't know, are up in the press box. But when you're on the sideline and the defense is on the field, it's it's you and Vernon Adams nonstop looking at film, going over stuff. So even these past couple of weeks, like when Vernon was not dressing, you could see that you guys were still going on it. He, Vernon was obviously being a supportive teammate. So how important is that to have that relationship with Vernon where on the sideline you guys are just breaking it down immediately and, and trying to fix things on the fly? Oh, it's very important, you know, and I, I was able to work with Vernon when we were in Montreal. So we have that relationship. And so coming back and looking at the plays and seeing, okay, what can we do better? Okay, where was the mistake at? Okay, it's right here. So he's seeing it. We both seeing the same thing. So now the next time we're out there, we get the same situation. We know how to correct it and, and make a positive play out of it. Awesome. All right. Uh, well said, Tuck. Uh, it's a pleasure to get you on, uh, as always. Uh, go enjoy the nice breeze, and uh, perhaps we'll catch up in a few weeks one more time. This was fun. Yeah, it was. A lot of fun. Enjoyed having being on. Great stuff with Tuck. Uh, just a down-to-earth good guy. Yeah, and obviously a legend in his own when it comes to playing the Canadian game too. So, and mm -hmm. I think you can just tell that these receivers are picking up the little tidbits that that Tuck uh, deployed when he was playing. And we were, when we had these legend conversations in here, Dominique Rhymes and Paris Jackson, two receivers, obviously wearing number nineteen for BC. Rhymes out of the blue brought up, or he, or he said, "I got I got to know what Tuck was like playing back in the two thousands. Like, what was it like going against him when he was in Edmonton and?" And Paris, the first thing he said, that, that corner out, right, with Ricky Ray, yeah, yeah. and that's what he was so famous for. So, yeah, it's and to see these these modern receivers now just excelling with Jason Tucker as their coach, it's awesome. Love uh, all the time in the world for him. Uh, we'll have to get him back on one of these days. And, um, yeah, uh, what receiver will lead the charge in Saskatchewan? That's going to be one of the many 
intriguing questions going into this game. Sunday game, it's a long week of preparation, recording this again on the Tuesday, just the walk through practice so far. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday have a better sense of injuries and possible guys coming back. I did notice Sione Tehema was, was back with the starters and uh, bclions.com and the social channels will have uh, the injury reports daily. Long week, luxury to give some guys some time to heal. Does Dane Evans get back dressing this week? We shall see. Not really an active participant uh, through the ball after Tuesday's walkthrough, but um, that's a game. You have the luxury now with VA back and healthy and performing well to maybe give him some time. Yeah, and then when it comes to the opponent this week, with it being Saskatchewan Rough Riders, I mean, you're going into Regina off the bat, so no, no matter who's out there, it's going to be a tough game going into Regina. But right now what i am got my eyes peeled for is uh, we don't, I don't think we even know who we're going up against that quarterback this week. That's yeah. an interesting storyline. Um, Saskatchewan did not do any on-field activity on Tuesday. Uh, get a sense Wednesday what they do. Yeah. Uh, Mason Fine, uh, the hamstring injury against Montreal. So we're going to see Jake Dolagala. They make the Antonio Pipkin trade mm-hmm. late on the weekend too. So Shea Patterson's still Shea there Shea Patterson, too, so. another guy we're familiar with. Yeah, a couple of former BC Lion quarterbacks uh, potentially on the roster. So yeah, uh, the preparation I don't think is going to change much. Uh, this defense knows how they have to scheme. Uh, they know they're going to have to attack Saskatchewan's offensive line. Uh, Rough Riders have a couple of solid guys at receiver, but who's going to be throwing it to them? Uh, we shall see. I'm not sure it's going to change much of the preparation. Hey, listen, um, team won there twice last year. One of those times in convincing fashion, of course, Nathan Rourke um, got uh, suffered his foot injury the second trip there around this time, late August in 2022. So they're not going to be taking anyone for granted here. Uh, this is a nope. Saskatchewan team that was embarrassed 41-12 in Montreal, fell victim to Caleb Evans. So there's a prime example there about how a backup can come in and and do some damage. So uh, the long week again just adds to the intrigue. But uh, it's another chance for this Lions team to wrap up a season series mm-hmm. against a divisional opponent. Yeah, and obviously yeah, the second meeting of the year between these two teams and Last last time in week seven when these teams met, it was, I think, Saskatchewan. They had four sacks in the game. I believe they all came in the first quarter, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, first so, half for sure. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. So they came off like firing on there. It was, I don't think it was many four man rushes. Like they were blitzing Larry Dean, who's an elite linebacker in this league. Pete Robertson is kind of getting going on with sacks and was looking at Dean has 60 tackles already on the year. So mm-hmm. yeah, those are some stars on defense. And then you got a guy like Nick Marshall, too, in the secondary, who was one of the best at his position. So they got, they got studs uh, on their team. And, even at receiver now, I think he got a couple of guys leading the league in yards and, and catches with uh, Sean Bain and Tevin Jones, right? So, yeah, they got weapons all over the field. Um, and then, yeah, going up, it, it can be tricky going up against an unknown at quarterback too. So, uh, like the work's cut out this week for uh, for the BC Lions, and it's it's going to be a fun one. I'm, it's a, it's the first Sunday nighter on the road for us too, right? That's right. Uh, had the Sunday game at home against Montreal. And yeah, Bain and Jones, three and four, respectively, in the CFL, trailing only Austin Mack of, Winni- of Montreal and Dalton Schoen of Winnipeg. Okay. So it just kind of shows you the production those guys, because they've had injuries, right? Uh, Key and Schaefer, Baker, um, and Jake Wenicke guys have been suffering from injuries, and just like we've seen, they have guys uh, stepping up. And yeah, you mentioned that 19-9 win over Saskatchewan back in week seven. Uh, our first game coming off the bye, July 22nd, I think it was. And Vernon Adams Jr. Uh, was on with Sakaris and Price this week on Tuesday. And, and he talked about how Saskatchewan had a game plan that they were going to get after him, and they did. Ultimately, it was the night VA went down. So, yeah, uh, the Lions offensive line uh, under a bit of scrutiny. A lot better last week, but be a nice test for them against uh, Micah Johnson and some of those names you mentioned. We always talk about the line of scrimmage, but being there in a tough environment makes it even more essential to perform in those areas. Yeah, and then on the flip side too, that game, one of the things that really stood out to me and I think overall in this game is I remember even the, the back chalk on the Tuesday of that week on our on tap show, we had Glenn Suter on and we were talking about, I, I asked Suter specifically saying if there's no Trevor Harris, it's Mason fine at quarterback as a backup. So do you think that with Jamal Morrow and Frankie Hicks and the riders are going to try and maybe run the ball like 30 times and just try and pound the ball and eat clock that way. And then 
Saturday or Saturday comes and Jamal Morrow has 12 carries for 11 yards and Frankie Hicks and carries it one time for three yards. So, and those are good running backs too. So that's an impressive feat by the front seven and the defense overall of the Lions. But I mean, I think you got to expect that Saskatchewan's going to come out with a, with a game plan to get those guys way more involved this week. So uh, yeah, like the work's going to be cut out, like I said, and those, those are just more guys that can make plays on offense for them. Sunday, 4 o'clock Pacific time, and as mentioned, our last Sunday of the regular season as far really? as game action oh, yeah, goes. So, yeah. Well, yeah, this Sunday night football thing is going to be done here yeah. in a couple of weeks, would it not be? Yeah. For obvious reasons. That makes sense, yeah. So, funny how it worked. Uh, remember, the Thursdays, <laughs> the two Thursdays in Winnipeg, the Thursday nighter in Calgary, CFL season Week opener. Week one, yeah. No Thursday at home, other than preseason. I think that That's was... Okay. I think that was, yeah, something we lobbied for given uh, the market research, shall we say, would indicate that Thursday night a tough sell in downtown Vancouver, especially in the summertime. Yeah, I like my sunny Saturdays. Yeah, English Bay, Kitts Beach, BC White Place. Rock Beach. BC Place. <laughs> BC Place, yeah. Terry Fox Plaza. Oh, you're talking sunny Saturdays for games. Sunny Saturdays at yes. like games, yeah. yeah. Thursdays you can go Sunny Sundays. Hang out at, sunny Sundays. Uh, if we're not in another road city. So we'll depart on Saturday at uh, AM 7.30, Moj, Julio, pregame action, 3 o'clock p.m. And always love going to Saskatchewan. Just two more road games after this week. Wow. Guy. Right? That's a, that, that that's kind of crazy, something like that. Going to go to Montreal, Labor Day weekend, and Edmonton later. Oh, sorry, three. Hamilton. Sorry, Hamilton. three. We go to Hamilton, That yeah. didn't seem right. That didn't but sound still, right, yeah. only only three once you're through Labor Day, only a couple more road games. Yeah, well, that's... even even firing up the the good old Premier Pro template today, and it says Week Eleven Saskatchewan, and I'm thinking Week Eleven already. Like it's flying by, right? Although yeah. when it kind it kind of goes both ways, I think that Week One Calgary game feels like forever ago too, right? It does. It goes yeah. both ways. Yeah, it's funny uh, doing a bit of research, game previews and stuff last week. Had to go back and watch parts of that game. I forgot Rhymes had the two first half touchdowns. touchdowns. Yeah. And yeah, that Rene Paredes forgot he missed a couple of field goals that uh, prevented yep. Calgary from being within one score late. Uh, solid team win that was the first time on the road uh, wearing those fog grays. So BC Lions are 7-2. and two. Uh, They've clinched season series against two Western opponents, Edmonton Calgary. They can do so again, uh, guarantee at least two wins against Saskatchewan. And it's funny, um, a win, you don't want to jump to conclusions, but a win here, and you can pretty much plan to have a home game, as crazy as that sounds, uh, going to be in this neck-and-neck -neck battle with Winnipeg for first place. But uh, not sure any of those teams will be catching uh, the Lions or Winnipeg for second if we get it done, but we'll just focus uh, one week, the task at hand. Mid-season awards. Uh, we might as well start with who the Lions' MOP would be. This one might not be as uh, much of a slam dunk as people might say, but I have to go with the quarterback, Vernon Adams Jr. Uh, still leads completion percentage, minimum 100 per, uh, attempts. Uh, he's tied with Chad Kelly, second, 13 touchdown passes. Um, if VA's going, the offense is going, and he's my choice, as is you, I think. I think you have to go VA, and I think there's got to be league consideration for VA at this point. Uh statistically looking at his numbers unfortunately he gets he gets credit for a game played with that that Saskatchewan game where he I think yeah. had three pass attempts and I think eight. I think it was the third series of the game he went down right and unfortunately is all that counts as the whole game played right yeah. so that that drops his yards per game all of that but mm -hmm. if you're looking at the six games Vernon's played from start to finish he's averaging I think 310 passing yards a game so and then Italian is yeah. rushing yards, and I think it's like 5,500 yard season that's over like a span of a full year. So he's playing some elite football. Obviously, the team's seven and two at his helm, um, or, or not seven and two at his helm, but there's would they be six and one at his helm? That's correct. Say again, they're six and one when, when he starts games, right? Yeah, or starts, yeah, six, five and one when he starts and finishes games. So there's there's the winning factor there. Dane Evans, the quarterback, a record in Winnipeg, Saskatchewan, yeah, in Winnipeg so, as well. The loss, yeah, yeah. so yeah. Yards per attempt is pretty high too, with nine point four over. Like you said, completing over seventy percent of his passes. But I think you got to throw in Matthew Betts in that conversation too, if you want to go for yeah. a league uh, MOP type season. Obviously, double digits in the sacks right now. Yeah, again, um, you know, a lot of these voters go by the stats, and they might look at the. Even though he's been very effective, they look at some of those sack numbers uh, have been stuck for a couple weeks at ten. But yeah, I, I you would have to be. 
in the discussion. Uh, absolutely. We've talked about Keon Hatcher. He's a dark horse. Yeah. Alexander Hollins, maybe to a lesser extent. Um, the people who vote on these things tend to favor the quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and say whoever finishes first in the West. At this point. It's going to be the quarterback of that team. It's going to be, like what we talked, who knows how serious Zach Caleras and his injury is. He's been not participating in Bombers practice, but he's been out there in street clothes helping the other quarterbacks. I don't think that's a long-term thing for him, mm -hmm. and he may very well play on Friday, but um, not too sure. A lot of it will depend on if he's out practicing for Winnipeg on Wednesday. Going off on a big tangent here, but uh, he's been Those on three, pace right? for a career year. You know, over 5,000 yards he's on pace for. So whoever emerges in this Western race with the first round bye to the final at home, um, I think the quarterback, if both of these guys, VA and Zach, keep on putting up the, the, the pace of numbers they're doing, I think that might be who emerges. So by default, that always says VA is the Lions MOP at this point. Yeah. And I think just based off those two quarterbacks, they're playing at an elite pace this year. Yeah. You said season high is on pace for so. In a, yeah, in a year where guys are getting injured and going down, uh, those two have been definitely a bright spot. And yeah, October 6th at BC Place should tell the story. You never know. Uh, most outstanding Canadian, this should be unanimous. It is Matthew Betts again. Still on pace to break Brent Johnson's record. If he breaks the record, he's certainly the Lions nominee likely the division nominee, uh, would face some stiff competition uh, with the likes of Brady Oliveira, just to name one, but uh, would have to go with bets for sure from a Lions perspective. Yeah, easily the front runner in this award category right now. I would say defensive player too. I will probably get into it after this, but he's probably yeah. the front runner too. Uh, if there's another name to throw out, Bola Combo's having a fantastic year. He's, mm -hmm. he's fourth in the CFL in tackles right now with over 50 on the year. Has two sacks, an interception, two pass deflections. So it kind of it's kind of going back to that 21 season with his most outstanding Canadian year where he was just a complete stat sheet stuffer right yeah and he's kind of back at that well, he's not kind of he is back at that pace right now which is fantastic to see uh one of the leaders on this defense a local player obviously too so fan favorite all of that so it's great to see Bo not only playing on a great level but staying healthy too yeah um I I, I predict bets will get a sack in Saskatchewan by the way heard it here first um, it was Menard last year that went crazy against Saskatchewan, right? I think yeah. he had like six last year against Saskatchewan. In the it? three meetings, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. All, all our guys did actually against Sask. Yeah, but, having those two as rotational players, uh, who would have thought? It It turned out well, despite what uh, some people uh, may have thought when uh, Betts was signed here. All right, <laughs> moving along from that. Yeah, most outstanding defensive player. I think we rattled it off. Uh, Betts, Lacombo, Gary Peters having his best year of his career. But if Betts is the Canadian, he's probably the defensive guy too, almost by default, right? G GP's making a case. So, I, I think. I think. Oh the G yeah, like GP's going to be listening to this. He's going to get motivated. I yeah. think. No, I think the national media is catching on to just how good and uh, much of a lockdown corner he was. I, I know they were talking about that in the broadcast last week that PFF had him ranked as the number one lockdown corner uh, in the entire CFL, and I think the the eye test meets that when you watch his play. Three interceptions now too, so the stats are there to kind of back it up and. Uh, our, our guys will tell you GP's the best in the league. I'll tell you GP's in the best in the league for when it comes to cornerbacks. So I think it, it, it's, it's bets is the flashy pick, but if, if you like your lockdown corners, Gary Peters definitely has a case. Best in the league. Yep. Yeah. Write it down, take a picture, send it to who he'll tell you that too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm speaking and then he'll lock you down. Him. Yes. The former Clemson tiger who once uh, shut down, OBJ in uh, the Chick-fil-A Bowl, I think it was. Uh, apologies, Tyler Gammon, LSU fan, if you are listening. Um, but, hey, we are we don't make the rules here. We, we just say what happened. Most outstanding rookie, um, a guy who maybe not be standing out to the average viewer, but, you know, we, we talk to people, we, we see the game through sometimes a different lens. You do for sure. What Ryder Varga has been doing on special teams uh, has been pretty solid. Yeah, and I think with this award too, just to specify a guy like Alex Hollins, although he um, doesn't didn't meet the he had to come to rookie camp this year because he didn't meet the requirement uh, for games played last season. Hollins does not qualify as a rookie because he's played in the NFL before. 
So that that makes him ineligible. Same with Taquan Mizell, for example. So those mm-hmm. guys are not eligible to win most of sending rookie. Um, some of the candidates, like you said, Ryder Varga probably is our front runner at this point, uh, based on his special teams play. Um, Amir Sadiq does qualify, and he's someone that has been getting defensive reps uh, these past couple of games. Um, yeah, I believe he 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 recovered the fumble against Montreal, right? That punt. That's right. Yeah, he recovered that Had punt. The sack on Jake Mayer last game. First too, career yeah. sack. Yeah. Uh, obviously in, in week 10 against Calgary there. So those are two guys that come to mind. Varga's a good story. Um, he was another guy kind of had like that bowl of cumbo mold where he was a stat sheet stuffer back in, uh, in Regina, back in the Ken West last year. So, uh, yeah, he's been, he's been, he's been good so far and it's, it's, it's going to be a fun race to look at so far this season. I'm um, just looking right now. Varga is our team leader with 10 special teams tackles. So there you go. Yeah. Um, one of those unsung heroes, Canadian draft pick, went back to school a year ago, and he was kind of one of those, for lack of a better term, kind of a forgotten man coming into camp because, oh, yeah, like Ryder Vargas here um, had a couple of those guys who opted to go back to school, but Ryder is still here. All right, uh, halfway home. Where has the time gone? Uh, it's August 15th. It's the middle of August. Uh, school, kids in the U.S. have gone back to school for the year. I don't know how kids in the States go back to school in August. I guess the flip side is they're done in the middle of June. Mm-hmm. So, are yes. You, are you forgetting two awards, Matt Baker? Um, rookie, defense, MOP, Canadian. Special teams. Special teams is one. Yeah. And I think we have we have a kicker that's 25 or 26 this year. That's Sean White. A local boy. Yeah. Playing some of his best football. And yes, by say 19 playing. straight two as well. Um, he's perfect from uh, 45 and less. His 49. Only, it says 49. 49. Here, His yeah. only miss came from 52. That's all I remember. So, yeah, Sean White is, yeah. And I would say a league candidate, too, at this yeah. point, right? He's got to be right in that conversation. So, shout out Sean White. And Has then, to be. How about, and then most outstanding linemen's an interesting one, too. Oh, geez, yeah. I, I am Another. off my rocker yeah. here. <laughs> well, I want to I, I wanna say, I want to I want to shout out Gerald Baroxen. Yeah. Coming in at left tackle this season. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, again, the voters, not knowing how close they all watch it, but I would be I would be stunned if um, it didn't always lean toward the blind side mm-hmm. protector. And yeah, Jarrell Broxton has his first full year as the starting left tackle, replacing Joel Figueroa. He has, he has been it. He has been that guy. I like... You go to the other side, though, Kent Perkins. Yeah, I think uh, Sook's a name, too. Sook, His yeah. physicality in the run game. I don't want to single anyone out right now, but... Unit's playing well. Yeah, you have so, to throw Andrew Pearson into the mix as well. Yeah, gee, how, how, do I, how do I forget the, the lineman? Jeez. He's getting old, Nick. <laughs> I'm not in a hurry to get out of here, right? It's not that at all. But um, thank you for uh, for keeping me on on my toes, so... Yes, seven and two, and uh, a lot. Uh, a lot is going to be determined this game. Again, I'm not going to count on on any team to help us out playing Winnipeg. Uh, the Bombers going into Calgary on Friday, um, so you kind of get the sense the Lions have to keep winning to keep pace and and stay tied or at least within a game going into that October sixth meeting with the Blue Bombers, the Gravy Bowl. Likely going to decide the West MOP that night. Um, again, I'm. I'm going out on a limb and, and saying that's going to happen. I'm so, with you. Good times. All right. Uh, we encourage everyone uh, to subscribe, rate, leave a review. Um, check out last week, if you missed it, Wally Buono talking Wall of Fame. Uh, we spoke with Andrew Pearson, speaking of Pearson and his commitment to to the Pure Later Tackle Hunger Program. I always love talking with Pearson, and it was great to catch up with Jason Tucker This week as well. Uh, BC Lions on tap runs Tuesday night. Get the podcast there. Subscribe to Lions Audio Network. Again, the full Wally interview last week. Uh, Taekwon Mizell, uh, two touchdowns for Smoke this season. Both receptions. Still has to rush for one, but he's contributing out of the backfield. Check out that. Lions Rough Riders Sunday. We'll be back to talk more about that after on First and Now, the official BC Lions podcast. 